I'll just read this to you and then we can go. But this is where my pen Why are you was. To me? Well, it, this my pen was here from Jeremiah 50 yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I open up my Bible to get my pen and go where we're going. Jeremiah preaches destruction and restoration. Jeremiah 50. That's what this excerpt is on. Hmm. No one envied Jeremiah. Hmm. Not then, not now. What a tough calling to be God's spokesman, tasked with delivering the most undesirable messages. <laughs> Jeremiah is unique in the fact he leveled accusations against God's chosen people for 45 chapters, but in 46 through 51, his prophetic voice is more consistent with the Hebrew prophets who proclaimed divine judgment against foreign nations. Hmm. Babylon would endure the same destruction and anguish she brought upon God's people. <clears throat> anyway, it's just after we had... <clears throat> so in the middle of this whole thing, it says there was reason to hope that they would be restored to their homeland. Mm. <laughs> Jeremiah was faithful to preach God's anger over injustice and his mercy towards his flock. In the face of injustice, may we trust God to defend his own and judge the unjust according to his sovereign will. Mm. <sighs> All right, where am I going? That's just... That's just the truth, Second Chronicles 18. You know, we just have these... Not these. We, we just have the word of God burning on our hearts over a generation. And I think if our generation looked different, we'd have different messages. It would be full of, you know, it, it would just sound differently, sound different. Um, but unfortunately, we are caught in a generation that looks a lot like historical accounts that can be tied to Jeremiah or, you know, prophets like that, or even more recently, Bonhoeffer. Mm. And, you know, people, we have so much history to really, uh, to make good decisions. And I think uh, for whatever reason, whether it's lack of courage or whether it's just lack of awareness or um, the desire to not want to preach what's on God's heart and instead preach what's on your mind and what you think is necessary to get the end goal that you desire, not what God is desiring. Um, it may alter the messages, but, you know, so I just was waking up thinking like, man, it seems like... <laughs> a lot of what God is putting on our heart is like, you know, you asked me this morning, like, how is this going to help anyone? <laughs> how is Jeremiah 50 going to help somebody in North Carolina right now? And, you know, there's a lot of questions that I don't have answers for, to be honest with you. But what I do know is um, when God calls you and he puts his words on your heart and you're stuck in, a, in an hour like we are stuck in or like Bonhoeffer was stuck in an hour that he was stuck in and he just decided not to shine. Do you want to give like two minutes of context? Yeah, so Dietrich to Bonhoeffer who? was a pastor in Germany during uh, Hitler's reign, before Hitler's reign and then during Hitler's reign. And, you know, um, Hitler was brilliant. You know, he was, he was just slick and sly and he used the church. I mean, absolutely used it for, you know, I say used it really confused and, and just trick the church into thinking that they were all on the same side. And, um, you know, eventually once people started to see his true cards, you know, the church kind of went silent for whatever reason. And their reasons that are documented is, you know, the, 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 the church needed to remain separate from the government and, mm. um, mm. the, that, Crazy. that they can just pray that Hitler would be saved and, you know, they had all of these good answers that were biblical, you know, 
um, God can save him. God can save us. God will save him. God will save us. He won't allow this to happen. And, you know, millions upon millions of lives being slaughtered at the silence of the church, at the silence of spiritual leaders. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one of the few pastors. Um, if it wasn't for him, there probably wouldn't have been any other pastor. But I think eventually people started to stand up with him. But he was one of the ones where he's just like, we can't be silent. Like, this is not the gospel. Like, this is not discipleship. This is cheap grace, what you guys are preaching. And so Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you can look it up. But, you know, we're in that type of hour where there's just mayhem going on. And um, we can keep producing hit worship albums and we can keep growing the most amazing ministries and we can keep preaching messages that tickle the ears of the people that are coming and motivate them and encourage them to, you know, get what they want out of the gospel. Or we can be the church, which is one that stands up for the oppressed, one that sets captives free, one that storms the gates of hell, one that demands justice, one that demands righteousness. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because we serve a holy God. Yeah. I mean, he's righteous. He's holy. He's just. Mm. Yes, he's merciful and he's patient and he's kind. But yeah, praise like God. His, his standard of excellence is yeah. it's beyond comprehension, mm -hmm. unattainable. And it's, it's just good. It's good for humanity. It's good for the earth. It's good for the ecosystem. It's good for the world. It's good for everything he's created. His, his laws and his recommendations, I say recommendations, but what he teaches us, is, it's because he wants everything to remain good, hmm. you know? And he knows, like, you've got to do certain things, and if you don't, then it's just going to alter everything that I've created. And so the reality is, you know, you, you were talking about that, and, you know, the story in Second Chronicles 18 just came up, and... Because I just well, want to lay the groundwork about, of... I was yeah. talking about what, I mean, the reason we're, this has even come up today is we, we have been pretty, um, I don't want to say consumed because we've done a lot this morning, but there's just been a lot of searching for the truth of what's really going on in North Carolina, which is only a couple hours down the road. And southern virginia and every this destruction from the hurricane that you know there we're on days now of people not getting aid as far as like being rescued i mean just not even like aid but just any kind of rescue missions and just hearing one of the people um i'm sorry i don't remember his name but i mean he has a substantial following he's there with the save the allies organization and you know he called the destruction both biblical and apocalyptic is what he you know the yeah. the level of destruction and you know there's a lot of there's a lot of people that have kind of the same theories this has never happened in this area this should have never happened in this area whether modifications and um you know the government not responding at all the president's on vacation the vice president's on the campaign trail the i mean to me both vice presidents last night were having a debate instead of canceling the debate and i'm, I'm just like when your country like if i were leading a nation your <clears throat> nation is your people and yeah your people this is more catastrophic than say like a 9-11 which we were both you know alive for yeah. um so there there was like a total you know response with that there's been like no response with this and then now people are saying you know the the federal people that are that are coming in are turning people away that have been there working for days they're threatening to arrest people or ground people that are flying their own helicopters. I mean, so there's just, we're in a day and time that there is a war in our nation over the soul of the nation and the people. When I say nation, it's, it's people. There's a war. They've made it look like peace. They've made it look like everything is fine. Um, truth is no longer truth. It's 
lies and it's whatever you want to believe. So, but they, but they make it look like they are the bearers of inherent truth, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, nothing is clear anymore. And there's really not any clear voices of clarity yeah. through any of it. Um, which is what, you know, you said you really felt like this came into your spirit to go read this in second Chronicles. So that's, yeah. you know, we are, if, if you're not burdened by what you're seeing now, I mean, I had, I admittingly hadn't really seen it like the first day or two, but I know a lot of people are just like, well, I mean, it's unfortunate, but got to keep going with my life. Like, yeah. and I'm, and I'm just, <laughs> this is, there is like, there is this level of people need awareness at like the level of the depth of selfishness where people are at, where it's like, oh, that sucks. But praise God, it's not my life. Praise God, it's not, not my house. Yeah. And, um, you know, it just really goes to show like, How do you there, feel there, about your neighbor? Yeah, there, well, there's just been a massive des, des, desensitization. Yeah, yeah, you say that. And yeah. then along with that, um, um, we've been desensitized as well as disconnected. Hmm. Yeah. And that's been the plan the whole time. Um, and so when things like this happen, it does not... Uh, elicit the same response of something. I read this article um, of this old lady. I think she was in her 90s and they were interviewing her. They had asked her um, a question and it was about, you know, something that could happen or what's some advice. I don't know what the question was, but it was she lived through the Great Depression. And they asked her a question and it was about something in the future that could happen. And she said, you know, my concern is I don't think the nation would make it the way we made it through the Great Depression because back then we band together and it's not the same today. Mm. And so she basically was saying, you know, the the how severed we are as a society would you know I think she said selfish people, is people it selfish are selfish not, yeah selfish and not because in because I am I mean <clears throat> I, I am seeing the response of people saying like the people that are helping in these devastated areas are the communities the churches and like peep just people not yeah, like yeah. any kind of yeah. you know no I'm just and there there is actually no response from the big organizations yeah. that should be in there helping the Red Cross, the FEMAs, the, uh, all the special troops that are prepared for these type of disasters. They're intentionally not being deployed or they're there three, four days late. Um, so, you know, you are seeing like some people. Yeah, for sure. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's not happening and it's not happening a lot. All I'm saying is, the reality is we have been desensitized and we have been disconnected. And so that does play a part into these moments of disaster, um, whether it's federally, locally, or whatever the case may be. But the point is this, um, I want to read this because a lot of what you're going to see us talk about, I mean, I'm just assuming because of the age in which we live in and what's going on in our country and in the world, it's not going to be probably what you would normally hear from most churches or ministries in person or online. So I, I just want to prep people for that, but I want to give some context as to why, why it's different, why what we talk about is probably different, why what we talk about usually will hit hard, why what we talk about can may come across judgmental or, you know, just confrontational or like we don't have a heart. And so uh, this story in Second Chronicles 18 I'm just going to start read it, reading it. It says, Now Jehoshaphat enjoyed, Jehoshaphat enjoyed great riches and high esteem, and he arranged for his son to marry the daughter of King Ahab of Israel. A few years later, 
he went to Samaria to visit Ahab, who prepared a great banquet for him and his officials. They butchered great numbers of sheep and oxen for the feast. Then Ahab enticed Jehoshaphat to join forces with him to attack Ramoth Gilead. Will you join me in fighting against Ramoth Gilead? asked Ahab. And Jehoshaphat replied, Why, of course, you and I are brothers, and my troops are yours to command. We will certainly join you in the battle. Then Jehoshaphat added, But first, let's find out what the Lord says. Mm. That was good on him to do that. <laughs> so King Ahab summoned his prophets, 400 of them, and asked them, Should we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or not? They all replied, go ahead, for God will give you a great victory. But Jehoshaphat asked, isn't there a prophet of the Lord around you too? Which is just, you know. The fact that he even discerned that all these people that just said that, something's off about this. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, we all, uh, you know, King Ahab was not a good king. Um, his wife was not a good person. No. Uh, Jezebel. And so, you know, although these may have been considered pastors or preachers in, in Israel, in a Christian nation, Jehoshaphat knew, like, yeah, these, this is not, like, I need to know who's, like, delivering the word of the Lord, not delivering what you want to hear, Ahab. So King Ahab replied, there is still one prophet. So Ahab knew, too. Ahab knew all these people in my camp are just telling me what I want to hear. Mm -hmm. We watched this interview with Trump uh, back in his first term presidency or after it or something no, it like that. it was after. It was yeah. after it. They did this interview and they had, he had it was on the Daily Wire. eight to 12 people around the table. It was yeah. the Daily Wire. I'm like, this is going to be good because usually Daily Wire puts out some pretty good stuff. And so I'm watching this interview and it was person after person after person after person after person. And, and they're basically doing the interview on, like, our country's, you know, not doing so well, this and that, that and this, whatever. And he's talking about his policies. But person after person, the only thing that was coming out of their mouth is praises to President Trump. They're not talking about real issues. They're not talking about things Trump should have Praising probably... all the things he did in yeah. his first term. But now we're in, you know... Yeah. It was, like, completely <laughs> out irrelevant of that. to... To was, the American was, uh, people or to anything. It was, the, it was the weirdest interview I've ever seen. Yeah. But it's like this room right here. These prophets, we think when we get in rooms like that, in order to stay there, or in order not to offend the person that's invited us, the king, the president, or whoever it is, like we need to tell them what they want to hear. And that's what these prophets were doing, and Ahab knew it. So what I'm saying is you're not fooling anybody. Like you're not fooling anybody. It's when crazy. push comes to shove, when crises come, when war comes, and kings or officials or whoever God's put you in front of, your family, when, when that time comes, they're going to want to know what God is saying. Yeah. Not like what I want to hear yeah. to make me feel good. Right. And so King Ahab replied, there is still one prophet of the Lord, but I hate him. He never prophesies anything but bad news for me. Mm. <laughs> and that's because... Ahab was just not godly. Hmm. So God's words towards him, Ahab didn't allow them to convict him. He got offended by them. So he viewed that as all you tell me is bad news of what's going to happen to me. Yeah. Well, it's clear. The Bible's clear. And this is, is the very beginning. Deuteronomy. These are your blessings. These are the curses. Yeah. These are based on if you listen, like yeah. if you do what is right. You yeah. Know? And so... Hmm. Yeah, so that's all he so, uh, verse Verse 7, King Ahab replied, there's still one prophet of the Lord, but I hate him. He never prophesies anything but bad news for me. His name is Micaiah? Micaiah. Micaiah, son of Imla. You shouldn't talk like that, Jehoshaphat said. Let's mm. hear what he has to say. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, quick, go and get Micaiah, son of Imla. King Ahab of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah dressed in their royal robes were sitting hmm. on thrones at the threshing floor near the gates of Samaria. All of Ahab's prophets were prophesying there in front of them. One of them, Zedekiah, son of 
Kanina <laughs> made some iron horns and proclaimed, this is what the Lord says. Isn't that what everybody's saying? It's what the Lord is saying. I'm preaching from the Bible. Everybody, everybody's preaching from the Bible. Everybody's preaching from what God is saying. How do you, di how do you discern, like seriously discern who's the prophets of Ahab and who's the prophets of the Lord hmm. when they're all calling themselves prophets? Hmm. I, I guarantee you the easiest way, one practical way to discern, and it's not all the time you you know let god discern it for you humble yourself god will test and approve every word that comes across you but one of the easiest ways to discern is what is everybody talking about and what are very few people talking about hmm. what everybody's talking about is probably not what god is talking about it's the it's the few people that are usually going against what everybody else is talking about or the ones that comes across you and you kind of get a little bit offended or a little bit upset or it's more of a depressing message than what you just heard on Sunday or from this Instagram account of this person that's motivating you to do whatever. So the well, easiest honestly, way. Honestly, that's the theme just to in interject that on that note, that is the theme from front to Back beginning to end yes. of the Bible. So I mean, it's that's so not just even the prophets of old. That that's no. after Jesus. That's, yeah, yeah. No, okay, no, yeah. like You're that's saying not the prophets of old. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is the entire Old Testament, and then the entire New Testament is is a select few, which um, yes. were the apostles. Yes. Then teaching things that were totally again still counter the system, yes. counter culture, all persecuted, for counter it. all what everybody's saying. I mean, even Paul was saying like, "I'm not a super apostle." Yeah. You know, like Apollos. Who's Apollos? It yeah. wasn't that wasn't that's not even one of the apostles. That that's not even who is that? You know, but um, and it's, it's so sad. Yeah. It's it is sad. And, and the hope I have, you know, the New Testament is so small compared to the Old Testament because it was supposed to be continued. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be continued to be lived out yeah. with all of our stories yeah. after Jesus yeah. to just continue adding to the testimony of, of Jesus Christ and in, in our lives. And so, you know, my greatest hope is that, you know, so many people, so often these churches and leaders, everybody wants to try and get back to the upper room. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to try and get back to the, the place where they added 3000 people to their numbers daily. You know? And I, that's the beginning of the church. Yeah. I'm trying to get to the bride status, yeah. maturity. Yeah. And I am hoping, I would hope that people would wake up and, and stop being so asleep that there's only a remnant select small few that's preaching the truth or what God is really saying. And the majority is still going over here with what everybody's, what I actually only want to yeah. hear. And you know, that, that is the difference with our generation, to be honest, compared to all these time. people is like, we, we have all this. No. Yeah. That, like well, these people were living <clears throat> it out at the time. Everybody's had something different in every generation, you know, start about, start back with, they had Jesus in the flesh. Then they had the disciples, just miracles and signs and wonders galore in, in a, you know, concentrated region, flipping countries upside down you know, for the gospel. And so everybody's had something that has given them no excuse that there shouldn't have been just a remnant of people mm. sounding, you know, shouting it's crazy today, thousands of years down the road with the amount of information and the amount of just everything, it still shouldn't be a remnant. But the fact you, we can look at our world and look at our country and understand it's still a remnant hmm. because if there were billions of people preaching the heart of God, we would not be where we are today. It's still a remnant. And so, um, I mean, definitely our country, because we have the freedom of speech and freedom of religion, and we were founded on Christianity. So we should be a, a light to the world of what it looks like when someone champions a message. That's the heart of God. Hmm. When someone's being willing to be persecuted for the message of the gospel, instead of prostituting the gospel. Hmm we should be the light of what that looks like. And we're not. When people look at America around the world, it's embarrassing. Yeah. 
we don't have any context for that because we're not consuming like social media of people just sitting around in their living room talking about how much of an embarrassment America is to the world if they claim to be who they are. And so, but, but I don't need context. I can look at my own country based on what we've founded it to be and where we are today. It's an embarrassment. And so the only thing that we can do is preach an unconventional message, um, which, which, which is the only hope that Bonhoeffer had. Yeah. So I was going to say, which is actually, when you talk about how wicked Jezebel and Ahab were, they were still the leaders of God's people. A hundred percent. It's com- still it, the leaders of Israel. And so, you know, it's like we, we are in, in this time, but we are still, you know, but as yeah. we read on. Which is amazing because, they, yeah, they were still the leaders. But what happens when one man is willing to preach the word of God? Let's find out. Okay, so uh, they made the horn. Uh, verse 10, let's start it there again. One of them, Zedekiah, son of Cananiah, made some iron horns and proclaimed, this is what the Lord says. With these horns, you will gore the Armenians to death. All the other prophets agreed. Yes, they said, go up to Ramoth Gilead, Gilead and be victorious. The Lord will give you a glorious victory. They are prophesying in the name of the Lord. Meanwhile, the messenger who went to get Micaiah said to him, look, listen, all the prophets are promising victory for the king. Be sure that you agree with them and promise success. Mm. But Micaiah replied, as surely as the Lord lives, I will say only what God tells me to say. When Micaiah arrived before the king, Ahab asked him, Micaiah, should we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or not? Micaiah replied, go right ahead. It will be a glorious victory. (laughs) But the king replied sharply, how many times must I demand that you speak only the truth when you speak for the Lord? Why would he tell that to him and And not his other prophets? (laughs) There's so much, there's, there's just let it penetrate your heart. There's so many roads I can go down, but I'm going to just keep reading. Uh, so Micaiah told him in a vision, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep without a shepherd. Did you remember that? No, no. I have chills. No. So we read yesterday. We literally just read this yesterday. I'm telling you. In uh, Jeremiah 50. I'm staring at this Bonhoeffer book. I literally am about to cry, but it's just... I have chills. I saw. He demands that he speaks truth in the name of the Lord. That's what we said yesterday. We just read you're, this yesterday. You're not fooling anybody. <laughs> Your sin isn't fooling anyone. You're not even fooling yourself. I saw all of Israel, all of America. Scattered on the mountains. Scattered on the mountains. Where are these storms? In the mountains. mountains. These kids are looking for... Sheep without a shepherd. They're finding children with no parents. Looking for their parents. My God. I demand that when you come before me, speak only what the Lord tells you. He's not fooling himself with his sin. Ahab knows. You're, you're not help when you know the truth, you're not helping someone in love because you're not telling them the truth about their sin. If you have proximity to someone and they invite you into their life, into their home, into their space, and you have the truth in your heart and you know what they're doing is not right out of love. You have to tell them it's not right. It may sever a relationship. It may cause some friction. It may whatever, but those people want to hear truth. Ahab demanded, when you come before me, tell me about the Lord. Tell me what the Lord is saying. And these people in your life, like when you're growing up as a kid, when your parents are doing the right thing, it's hard sometimes. It hurts sometimes. But for that kid that never had a parent to tell them, son, don't do this. Daughter, you shouldn't sleep with that. Son, don't do that. When I was growing up, I made this mistake and I shouldn't have. You're about to make it. Don't do it. If you didn't do that as a parent, your kid gets 20, 30, 40, your kid starts having kids and then they start to see these moments. They come to you and they say, what, why didn't you tell me? Yeah, it's actually, I mean, I I have a very similar experience growing up 
Yeah. I mean, it's actually very detrimental when parents are not, which is, which is why God is a just parent, just a just and, and righteous and loving parent to correct. Um, because when you are raised by a parent and then, and, and you're in a church that is being led by a pastor can be likened to this. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. That operates out of permissive love mm. Mm. is what it's called. It is detrimental mm. to say that out of love, you will not correct people. Mm. It is so you what you're doing, it's like Bonhoeffer said, to be silent in the face of evil is evil itself. Yeah. Like you to permit things, to permit behaviors, thinking you're loving someone unconditionally, you're actually destroying them. A hundred percent. And you and that goes for parenting, pastoring, friending, <laughs> marriage. I mean that like we went it. through times in our marriage where I I saw other marriages and was modeled to this unconditional love thought became which is really very permissive mm -hmm. and it's just masking itself as unconditional and what you allow people to do to you then is to continue to operate in their destructive mm -hmm. behavior and really it, it not only destroys them it destroys you yeah and like i know for us i mean for just me and my life like that's then when i became an adult i abhorrently w would not be permissive yeah. because it, it sh it's destructive it yeah. like it, it it leads to destruction and honestly like it's leading to destruct we're, we're god is literally saying it yeah you're whoever your sheep are whether that's your children or your congregation or whoever your sheep are that you're if appointed you're a boss over or a manager yeah yeah whoever that flock is that company. you are the leader of yeah. like it is not just church and home no. i mean it's anything it's like honestly look what the finite the the end of this prophecy is and the lord said these have no master these sheep scattered on the mountain have no master let each return to his home in peace mm. insane they're talking he was talking he was prophesying against ahab yeah the king of the country the lord said their master has been killed send them home in peace yeah go back home. so so god is literally saying like ahab yeah which today because we're in october of 2024 that would be likened to biden yeah i mean that's the master yeah. of the nation yeah and whoever it is in november yeah. you know i mean so it's like this this message is for not just for pastors yeah. this is for anyone in leadership from home to the white house in any in any capacity if you are leading people you are a shepherd hmm. and if you are permissively loving them or permissively operating in just telling people what they want to hear yeah. like you're destroying them yeah. those prophets they think they prophesied to ahab in, in uh you know, maybe not in love, but yeah. it was just like they told him what he wanted to hear. Yeah. What? Just like the Trump. They told him what he wanted to hear instead of telling him you were slothful with your second running of your term. You thought you had it in a bag. You didn't. Let's not do that next time or learn your lesson from that. Learn a little bit more humility. Um, we it's amazing that you're you have courage and you're courageous and you're, you're willing to say, but get some people around you that can that can breathe a little bit of humility in your life. Like tell some things that could help assist in in the person becoming a better person or whatever God's told you to tell him. But really like what that all boils down to the root of that is that you fear God and fear God only. Uh -huh. And that's the, that's the difference with Micaiah and all the other prophets. Yeah. Like I, he declares to the, the man, um, as long as the Lord lives, whatever God says for me to say, yeah. I will speak. Yeah. I mean, and there's real pressure. Uh, like we're empathetic to that. There's real pressure. Like those prophets coming to him. Look, everybody is saying this. 
you know, if you want to be in this camp and you're sitting before the king now, you need to agree with what everybody is saying. There's a lot of and real so, pressure. I mean, for us, you know, when we were being in ostracized, and when we were in get back then, church, they cut your head off as a king. You know, you said something wrong. Well, now we go through cultural, yeah. uh, social. De- social death, you yeah. know, like, um, I mean, even when we were campus pastors and in a really hip, cool church and huge community, like we wouldn't have in a million years said any of the things we God burdens us to say Never. now, because honestly, Never. like we loved people more yep. than we loved God yep. and we prioritized our time with people more than we prioritized yep. our time with God. And as much as we were in church, we were not in the word yep. as much as we were in church. Yep. And I even remember and going to conferences in, we bought into the vision of the collective of the group more than the vision of what God has. It's just so many things. Yeah, it's so true. But remember we went to that conference and that senior older pastor, he's maybe like 50, 60, something like that. Mm -hmm. And he was like, if you think that becoming a pastor and leading a church is about sitting in your office, reading your Bible and praying, you've got it wrong. wrong. Like you got to find time to do that outside of, and I'm like, what? (laughs) We're in, I mean, that was towards the end when we were like really feeling led to, to go and, and to leave. Um, and that just didn't sit, you know, yeah. with me. I'm just like, what? That that should be like the one thing the the actual like man of God, woman of God, family of God, whatever it is, like whoever's yeah. leading, that should be the the thing they do, yeah, actually. <laughs> um, but the only way you the only way you have the confidence to be the one that goes against the entire flow. Or to be the voice of God, like Jeremiah was, who's like, God, I'm literally, why? You know, laid out bare, you know, with what you're telling me to say. It's just that, that there is that proper alignment that Mm -hmm. you, you then fear God more than you fear people. Just like he told Isaiah, Isaiah, he said, fear me more than you fear anyone else. I'm, I'm the one that has the ability to take away, you know, life and, yeah. and soul. And, um, in a vision, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, their master has been killed. Send them home in peace. Which is so crazy. Didn't I tell you the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, he does it every time. He never prophesies anything but bad news for me. Then Micaiah continued, listen to what the Lord says. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the armies of heaven on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, who can entice King Ahab of Israel to go into battle against Ramoth Gilead so that he can be killed there? Hmm. Just let that sit on you. There were many suggestions until finally a spirit approached the Lord and said, I can do it. How will you do this? The Lord asked. Hmm. And the spirit replied, I will go out and inspire all Ahab's prophets to speak lies. (laughs) It's such a big, it's so much bigger than we think. We think, oh, just no big deal. At least they're preaching Jesus. They'll throw that Paul phrase out. Oh, just at least the gospel is being preached. At least it's being preached. I'm telling you, y'all, people need to be careful with that nonsense. Like, praise God, Jesus is being preached. I love it. Everybody who preaches Jesus. But there are seasons when nations are being led by absolute wicked people. Hmm. And that Paul message stuff, at least Jesus is being preached and it's messages that are from the people and not from God. This is the result of that stuff. It's not at least Jesus Christ is being preached. It's God is asking Ahab's time is up. Who's going to entice him to go in battle? Mm. I'll do it. How are you going to do that? I'm going to do it through the pastors. I'm going to just get them to preach, prophesy some lies, pleasant prophecies. Tell the people what they want to hear instead of what you're saying. All right. So this is what he said. You will succeed, Mm -hmm. said the Lord. Go ahead and do it. So you see, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of your prophets. For the Lord has determined disaster for you. 
Then Zedekiah, son of Canina, walked up to Micaiah and slapped him, Mm. which is always the result. (laughs) It's unfortunate, but it is. Slapped him across the face. When did the spirit of the Lord leave me to speak to you? Mm. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. And Micaiah replied, you will find out soon enough when you find yourself hiding in some secret room. King Ahab Mm. of Israel then ordered arrest, ordered arrest Micaiah and take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city. And to my son, Joash, give them this order from the king. Put this man in prison and feed him nothing but bread and water until I return safely from battle. Mm. But Micaiah replied, if you return safely, the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added to those standing around, take note of what I have said. So the king of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah and their armies against uh, and their armies against Ramoth Gilead. Um, so the king of Israel and King and King Joash of Judah led their armies against Ramoth Gilead, which I will say. There, there is a, there's just, I, I don't even know how to describe it besides just like the, uh, a fear of the Lord to know when you're speaking for him, you, you are very careful as to what you're, you're saying. It's not just, you know, you're just very careful because you know, like if it is from the Lord, it will come to pass, but you also know, like it's not always your timing. It may take 20, 30, 40 years. You know mm, what I mean? Yeah. Or it may be tomorrow. And it's like, you know, these are the things that you, you have to understand willing, being willing to be a mouthpiece of the Lord. Like he's dealing in generations. It's outside of your time. It's outside of how you think it should happen. It's outside of everything. And so, um, that's just, something to really pay attention to. King Ahab said to Jehoshaphat, as we go into battle, I will disguise myself. So King Ahab knew. Convenient. He was scared. <laughs> he, he, knew, he knew what was up. That's what I'm saying. These people know. They're not fooling themselves. They're not fooling anybody. They're just fooling you to think that, you know, you need to lie to them to make them feel better about their sin. I will disguise myself so no one will recognize me, but you will wear my royal robes. <laughs> How did Joe jo- Hassan that was just fooled, man? I mean, I would have been like crazy. the what? So Ahab disguised himself when they went into battle. Now the king of Aram had issued these orders to his charioteers. Listen to this. Attack only the king of Israel. <laughs> So they were after one man, Ahab, okay? And, and Jehoshaphat is dressed up like this dude, okay? <laughs> so when the uh, Armenian charioteers saw Jehoshaphat in his royal robes, they went after him. There's the king of Israel, they shouted. But Jehoshaphat cried out to the Lord to save him, of course. And God <laughs> helped him by turning the attack from him. As soon as the charioteers realized he was not the king of Israel, they stopped chasing him. Mm. An Armenian soldier, however, randomly shot an arrow at the Israelite troops. And the arrow hit the king of Israel <laughs> between the joints of his armor. Get me out of here, Ahab groaned to the driver of his chariot. I have been badly wounded. The battle raged all day and Ahab propped himself up in his chariot facing the Armenians until evening. Then just as the sun was setting, he died. Mm. It's, it's just so, it's, we are in a war. We are in an absolute war. And I think everybody can find themselves in this story. And the reality is, you know, we have just been burdened to be the Micaiah in our generation, to be the Jeremiah, to be the, the people all throughout the Bible, the Noah that had to preach for decades upon decades against all odds against all science, against all, really, like, the heart of God. You mean he's going to flood the whole earth and kill everybody? Mm. It's just against all odds. Noah had to preach a message of repentance. It's always this message of repentance. It's the message of we've gone too far. We've strayed away from our father. 
we've strayed away from the person that protects us. We've, we've like, we're outside. We, we need to come back home. Mm. You know, it's and that, and that's essentially the message of repentance. It's the prodigal son. It's mm. all wrapped up in the story of the prodigal son, what we're preaching, all of these things, the Jeremiah, the, the second, this, this story, <laughs> the, the Micaiah, the Ahab, all of it can be wrapped up beautifully in the story of the prodigal son. We, we get to live on an estate with our father. Mm. That is just ultimate paradise. We have responsibilities, our fa- it's family, it's, you know, we get to live this life, but then we just get this urge, this itch, this desire that this, this, there's this world out there. And I just, you know, I, I'm just, I'm distracted and I want to go see what it's about. Mm. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not satisfied. There's the enemy's crept in somehow and got me thinking like I should be out there instead of here. So then we go to the father and we ask him to bless us. God, give me this job. Give me this promotion. Give Mm. me this house. Give me this. Give me that. Give me that. Let me, let me, let me make this football team. Let me make it to the NFL. Let me make it to the NBA. Let me, let me win the Senate. Let me, let, let me become president. Whatever it is that we're chasing for our own good, not because God called us to. It's what we want. And the father says, okay, you can have it. You can have your inheritance early. I'll give that to you. So we get out of the estate and we start acting the fool and we squander, squander everything because we're doing it for us, not for him. And anytime mm-hmm. you're doing something for yourself, it's never enough. It's not ever going to bring happiness. Mm-hmm. It's not ever going to scratch the itch that you think needs to be scra- it, it's, it's going to do the complete opposite if you're honest with yourself it happens every time and so praise god that son because most of us don't but that son was like yeah this is crazy i had a maid at home mm. like i my position i was the son but like if i can just go back and be a servant i it's better than the world it's better than what i'm doing mm. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that guy's eating pig slop. Of course he's going to say that. Well, so are you. Like anything away from the father, it's likened to eating pig slop. You, you just dressed it up a little bit better. And so, you know, your, your paycheck is a little bit bigger than his. It was working with pig farmers. The devil's tricked you to think that you're not eating pig slop. Hmm. But anything outside of the father's arms is pig slop. And so he came to his senses. He humbled himself. I came to my senses. I humbled myself. I wasn't eating pig slop, but my life was a complete mess and I was eating pig slop. And so what you have to realize is at some point you have to come to your senses like that son and just run back home. That's the message. Just come back home. Mm. He came back home and he was he was shamed. He was preparing his message. He was ready to, you know, just be the least of those in the household. And then guess what? The father sees him and he comes running after him. And he gets there in front of the father and, he, and he's ready for his speech. And the father doesn't even want to hear it. He's like, I've sinned against you in heaven. And at that point he just starts hugging him and kissing him and throwing robes on him and rings on reinstating him back into the family welcoming him home Hmm. preparing the party and he's like how dare you even try to get out of your mouth that you're here to be a servant like you're you're my son Hmm. god's our father we're his sons and daughters and and the reality is we just need to come back home Hmm. like just come back like you 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 think it's better what you're doing or you think it's better away from him and it's what he told the other son you know when that son came back he's like i've been i I didn't go anywhere i didn't squander your wealth i didn't what like why are you throwing this big party for him father said everything i have is yours Hmm. and that's the reality ever like god is so good Like he has a cattle on a thousand hills. He is the creator of the world. Everything in his possession is ours. There is nothing, there is nothing he will withhold from us. And all he wants is for us to realize and for us to be in relationship with him 
and he sets out these things for us because it's to protect us. It's the parent telling the child, like, like I'm going to have to tell my children one day the mistakes I made. Don't do that. Uh, don't make that decision. Don't think like that. Don't hang out with that person. This is what I did. These are the mistakes I made. I'm not going to withhold from them. And then I'm going to outline things that they should do to have a good character, to have good morals, to to be a man and a woman of your word. It's just like this is this, this is the standard of the strong family. You will uphold that standard, absolutely. Or you're going to go out and eat pig slop. <laughs> and I'm not going to go chasing you in your pig slop. I'll be here at home waiting for you to come home. And so it's like, yeah, it's the tension of the gospel. God is after the one, but like the son actually has to come home too. So there's this, this mutual. He meets you on the road, but there has to be this mutual. You, you have to like desire to, to come to your senses and want to come home. So... You know, our messages can be encouraging. They can be inspirational. They can be all of those things um, for those who have an ear to hear and, and eyes to see. But, you know, a lot of the time you probably will come across things that seem to be a Micaiah type message where it's just like. Yeah, yeah but that's actually the caveat when you are when your heart is for God and the things of God and the ways of God. These messages are comforting because, one, you know that you, God is still speaking to his people. That's, mm. that's the ultimate comfort. Yeah. Is that if he's sending a warning, it's because he loves his sheep, he's yeah. burdened for them, and he wants to bring them home again. Yeah. To their own homeland, to their own place, mm. to be protected by a good shepherd. That's the, the father's so heart. So, so whenever you hear somebody rising up with messages of warnings, messages of um, repentance, messages of turn back to God, for, for those who love God and they want God, those are messages of comfort because one, it can give you an opportunity to self-reflect. Am I being convicted? Is this, am I noticing a twinge of offense in myself? That's probably if, if it's offense, it's your flesh. If it's the spirit, it's conviction. So conviction should not bring shame. Conviction should bring change. Yeah. So God, you're trying to get my attention yeah. in this day and time. You're actually trying to warn me. Yeah. What should I do? What does turning and coming back home to you look like? What like, so that's can, can, convicting for people who set themselves up against God. These messages are depressing, yeah, hateful. That's good. You can't stand it. Why? Cause that was Ahab's response. Yeah, that's good. And Ahab couldn't stand God. Yeah. He couldn't stand God's prophets. Yeah. He persecuted them. He turned the country to worship Baal. Yeah. Ahab was not of God. And so therefore he didn't want to hear what God's people had to say. Yeah. So that's the reality if, and that, that's, the, that's the heart check people have to question. They have to ask themselves, but I think in our culture, because we have become such a democratic, very, uh, politically correct. Yeah. Everything has to be politically correct. Yeah. Everyone has to not offend. Yeah. Everyone has to be very mutual. No matter how much somebody is abhorrently doing something yeah. in front of you, you must be amicable. You know, that's what we're being taught now yeah. because that's what a lot of people have been raised in now. Mm -hmm. And they've grown up with that. And that's their, that's their normal. Mm -hmm. It's not that it is normal, but it's become their normal. Yeah. That is where people are, totally thrown off by the true word of God mm. because they think that's not love. That's not Jesus. Yeah. That Jesus said, you think I came to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Yeah. And he, the first time Jesus came, he came as a lion. I mean, yeah. a lamb. The first time Jesus came, he came as a lamb. Yeah. When Jesus is coming back, he's coming as a lion. Yeah. Just like when they said Jezebel was described as first this, you know, this and in, in when she was first on the scene and she's described as like a, a, what is it? A dragon in revelation or something like the spirit of Jezebel mm. is like still alive. Like basically you see that 
Oh, that's somebody said that. The devil in Genesis is a serpent. Mm -hmm. In Revelation, he's a dragon. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, it's like Jesus is no different. Yeah. He came as a lamb the first yeah. time. He was sacrificed yeah. the first time. Yeah. He redeemed the world. He's yeah. coming back as a lion. Yeah. Like he's coming back for vindication. 100%. He's on the and, offense now. Yeah. And he told us to be on the offense. Yeah. 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 yeah so, so for those who have an ear to hear and eyes to see, this message will not be offensive. Yeah. It'll be confirmation. Yeah. If anything. Yeah. Um, and so that's what, you know, when you're, when you're burdened to follow God, there, there will always be separation. People are claiming the harvest is coming right now. Yeah. People are prophesying like this is harvest time, harvest time, harvest yeah. time. Like we are, we are on the, on the brink of it. We're travailing for it. Well, to be honest, do you, do you know what harvest means then? Harvest means a great separation. Yeah, you ever yeah. seen harvest? Yeah. They, Separate you the wheat you from separate the, the wheat from the chafe. There's going to be a great separation yeah. then of God's people. Which is there design. is going to be a sifting. Yeah. This is harvest. Sure, yeah, sure it is. Happening. You know what happens then? They burn the chafe. Yeah, they, that, that's actually. Uh, happening. I mean, it's like that. Yeah. yeah. Fine. Great. I I want harvest season. Yeah. I want a sifting out. Well, we need what, a sifting yeah, out. Well, yeah. That part of harvest season is coming. And that's what, you know, needs to be talked about because that's the part of harvest season that's going to come before you actually get your harvest, you know, before you actually get the product that you, that everybody is wanting. <laughs> yeah. So if you, if you know that harvest season is coming, you know, the lion of Judah is coming, you know, Jesus is coming. Yeah. Well, what, what comes before that is a call to repentance, yeah. a call to turn back yeah. because God loves his children. Mm -hmm. He loves everyone. He wants to give everybody that like Jeremiah prophesied this, this destruction of God's people. God has abundant mercy. He allowed him to give them warnings for 30 years. Mm. I mean, it's like the stuff with the weather, what we're seeing, like it is biblical. It is a biblical apocalypse because we, the earth is, we are just as connected to the earth as we are to God. He literally formed us out of the earth. The earth is groaning and travailing. <laughs> Yeah. For the children of God to rise up, rise up, <laughs> yeah. rise up and take back your seat of authority. Yeah. Because who is in authority right now is not children of God. Yeah, yeah I agree. So there's just, there's no separation. Don't let them fool you to think that, you know certain things should be separated and the church should stay out of this and stay out of that. The church was in everything in God's model. And so, you know, mm. in our nation, I don't live in China, so I live in America and this is not anything about Chinese people or China itself. I'm just saying I live in a country where there is no separation. Um, well, there's no separation because the we, church is actually not an organization and it's not a building. Yeah, the church should've. is people. Yeah. And, and this I nation was founded thing, on we, the people. That's the one thing that I think in this hour that we're going to have to, in order to be an effective army uh, of the living God as his body in mm -hmm. this hour, I think we do not need to make the same mistake that they did make in Bonhoeffer's days, the confessing church. They were first a movement and Bonhoeffer later realized he should have remained a movement and not became a organized church. That's what... That's when the movement started to die. And so, and I'm not saying anything against organized churches or anything, but I'm saying the most effective uh, unit to be assembled would be the ecclesia organically being led by way of the spirit taking back this country. And I know that scares people, freedom scares people. That's why, that's why the government's trying to kind of wrap trying to wrap freedom up really they're trying to put parameters around it i think they think our forefathers made a mistake or something um i, I think people inherently are f afraid of freedom and i think uh the gospel scared a lot of people and that's why they started to you know put some <laughs> some red tape around that thing a free people is is scary but god created us that way mm. who who are we 
that's what that's that's why our documents are so inspired if 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 anyone tries to ever question anything we hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator it's like we we were given these things we were endowed an endowment we were given these things by our creator god not by a government hmm. our life our liberties the ability to pursue happiness i mean so many things is wrapped up into that one statement that we hold these truths to be self evident it is like god the creator not the government the government is there to protect the rights that god has given you mm -hmm. the end no questions asked the government is in place to protect your inalienable rights that your father your creator gave you they recognize that as a government that's their that's their that's their goal that's their um job description that's what they're there for and so if a government becomes destructive in that matter hmm. it is our right to overthrow it mm -hmm. guess who's going to overthrow that a people who believes in a god that's a creator and we're his children those are the people that will storm the gates of hell hmm. it will not be a religious organization that's trying to protect their 501c3 status mm -mm. they no. will try to protect <clears throat> their little government and stay out of the big government because their little kingdom cannot fall but if you have a movement of people that does not care about a status given to them by their government but they care about their liberties given to them by their god they will storm those gates because you're trying to put us in prison hmm. and take away our God-given rights. And the only thing that is going to stop anyone from doing that is a people on fire and a people led by the spirit of the living God, their creator. Hmm. And so people need to understand that in this country. Like, do not ever tell them you need to stay out of politics. Do not ever tell them you need to stay out of schools. Do not ever tell, don't let people tell you that. It, like the fact that we have my kids aren't in a public school but if they were it would be a hundred thousand percent unacceptable but that i pay their salaries by way of my taxes and you're taking my god out of that place that i'm sending my kids mm. the fact that christian families have allowed that to happen is ludicrous you parents need to wake up you fight for your raises more than you do for your kids you gotta wake up they're literally these they're devouring your kids because you allow them to take the one protection that they had out of that place that you send them eight hours a day, which is your God. The fact that we do well, not you, and you have to, you know, just like the, the biblical principle of, you know, when you clean house, like if you remove the spirit from the house, like if you don't fill it with something, it's it's going to fill back was seven times worse you know so it's like if well if you remove god out of school like it's only going to be filled then with an uh, evil spirit not the spirit of god so you know i mean it's like but what you're saying is you're saying it's going to be the ecclesia i mean that's the word jesus used when he's talking to peter and he's saying i'm going to build my church you know, which was actually different than the systematic church of the day, yeah. which you never saw Jesus return back to the synagogue once the veil tore yeah. when he was on the cross. Yeah. He never went back into an established church building. He appeared in homes on the road to his disciples and apostles. But when he used that term ecclesia, you know, that that is a term for called out ones which is what you're saying a movement of people an organic growing movement of people that realize their true identity who god made them to be yeah. what god endowed them with inalienable means it cannot be separated from the person it was endowed upon yeah you so you cannot alienate me and my rights yeah. you can't separate yeah. it and the ecclesia is a legislative branch he used that word he used 
is had a legislative connotation mm -hmm. to it. So a self-governing group of people yeah. that are called out, yeah. called out from the systems, called out from what were they called out from? They were called out from their jobs. They yeah. were called out. They were called out from something to follow Jesus, ex to inherit their true identity, which is kingdom of God. Yeah members, members of a new kingdom, kingdom of God, to then be sent out to reflect that from which you came from, which yeah. I have now come from the kingdom and I'm being sent out to reflect that. And that's what America was founded on, mm. was that group of people called out from a nation to go set sail to establish something in freedom. Yeah. And people will... <laughs> And that group of called out ones should have the virtue and liberty within themselves set on godly principles mm -hmm. and godly foundations yeah. to be able to self govern yeah. themselves. 100%. That is where we, the people come from. That is why when we say go home, take possession of your home again, your yeah. home is more important than any other house. It's because a people group that are established, rooted in their true identity, which then aligns their virtues, yeah. moral vir virtues. And that's why people take freedom away. It's why the government takes people away. Because if you don't give people, you know, if, if people are no longer governed by virtue mm -hmm. and by God, yeah. they're governed by evil. Yeah. I mean, like it is good or evil. Yeah, so if you're not so governed by God, that. like you are governed by evil and so you, then they you step in and put parameters around it. Right. And so we, and then us. it's just like when you stepped in and put the law in place yeah. that God allowed the law to be put in place so that we would actually realize our sin. Yeah. And so when that is where the new covenant comes in, that is where Jesus, yeah. the new covenant of Jesus written upon your heart yeah moves you in right, yeah. what is right and wrong. Yeah. You are, you are able to then know you are able to then hear the word of the Lord and say, yeah. that's convicting to me. Yeah. I've got to change things. I've got to change things in my life. I am not self-governing myself yeah. in virtue. Yeah. A direct proportion of the, 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 the more God is removed from a nation, the more laws have to be created. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The more absolutely. God is in a nation, the less laws have to be Absol created. Yep. Thousand and you keep percent. wondering, oh, why are they making a new law with this? Why are they trying to take our guns? Why are they trying to do this? Are you so worried about the stinking gun law? It's because God's being removed more and more and more and more and more and more and more. You need to be worried about the fact that we're taking God away from the nation, not your guns. Mm. Because if God increased in this nation, they wouldn't care about your guns because you would know how to use them and mm. when to use them and how to use them. Because you would be self-governed with righteousness. But when you're not self-governed with righteousness, which is where the nation has allowed the people to go, which is what we're teaching people in our schools, just to be lawless and to do whatever you want. And well, YOLO. And honestly, what so we're now the government comes behind people, that. Period, and I've church. got to save these people because they'll just set out to kill each other. So I've got to create or all these laws. Or they're the ones doing it to yep. then take and away. And then <laughs> I've got to start creating all these things and we're going to go in this massive amount of debt because now I've got to take care of these people because they're not self-governed. They don't steward things properly. They don't work properly the way they... It's, so it's just like... The government becomes your God because God's gone. And it's what they asked for in the Old Testament. They wanted a king. And he's like, you don't understand. You have me. No, we want a king. We want somebody that's going to govern us in the flesh and birth. But this is what, and then he told them, this is what his king's going to do to you. And so then he set us free from that. Not that we should not, but he set us free from that to be self -governed. That's what they came over here and established. They're like, we have this access and availability. I don't know where it came from. It was inspired thought by way of the Holy Spirit. They formed the nation. More God, less government, all things great. Hmm. And the more and more God came out, the more and more government got bigger, 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 bigger. And the government's gonna continue to get as big as humanly possible to the point where they control every single thing that you do. It's called communism, socialism. They might even come up with something new in this country where that we're so far off the map. It might even be their own thing. But the, they will continue to take every area of your life until you bring God back in. And you increase God, it will naturally decrease government. It's that simple. God should be in our health care. God should be in our food system. God should be in our schools. God should be in our churches. 
Imagine that. God should be in every aspect of your life. Well, all but those things should he's flow removed, out of your home. Because he's removed, guess who's there now? Government. FDA, food system, governments in the healthcare, governments in the schools. It's all government everywhere. It's all government. And so, yeah, it's, you're, you're right. Everything naturally should flow from the home. But I'm saying the root of the thing. It's to very simple to understand. You're either going to be... You, you will be willing to be under the fear of the Lord, being led by the Spirit of the Lord with God, living under God, or you're going to replace that with government. And I promise you, these people do not have your best interests at heart. Well, we see that. They're and not so, coming to save and you. And God's your father. He's your parent, and he's a good father. And he has every best interest. He knows every hair on your head. Biden couldn't count 10 hairs on your head. Neither could Kamala. Neither could Trump. And neither could none of these people. And I'm not talking about any of these people. I'm trying to tell you God wants the absolute best for your life. Absolute. Und he, he's the one who created you. He knows what your life is going to be. Like, why wouldn't we want to live under that?